setting of that meditation, we will recite the Tara Mantra again. And then I will give a little bit of a lecture about <coughs> anger and patience. Women, anger, and patience. Okay. Especially, especially according to or in, in tune with the great teaching of Shantideva. First, the meditation. Okay, so go into meditative mode and try to sit up in meditative posture. Bring your back straight. Doesn't matter if you're in a chair or not. And ankles crossed, leg, hands connected. Eyes half closed, ideally. And uh, focus of your nose, if you have a good sized nose, if you have a little nose a little bit in front of you. <coughs> and uh, chin a little tucked, and as if a, a little string was tugging at the very crown of your head, so pulling your spine straight, but not with a lot of pressure. Just a kind of suggestion proud straightness. That's a good meditation posture. Observe your breath. Without breathing too deeply or too shallowly. Leaving, trying to leave it in a normal rhythm. Enjoying your breathing. The wind energy itself coming with the in breath is a stream of energy of Great Mother, Tara. Tara is wind. She's also a wind energy going out to heat and nourish the plants. Now turn your attention backward into yourself. Look into your own face into your own body and mind complex to see if you can find something that corresponds in any sort of substantial way to your sense of I, <coughs> the real you. Looking upon your material processes and energy processes, scanning your material structures, scanning your sensations, scanning your ideas and thought streams, scanning your emotions, and the sense of presence. Scanning your awareness that is scanning, even. As you do that, you feel a little lost, and then you don't come up with any kind of inner you, a kind of replica of the outer you that you see in the mirror, but in some sort of fixed form. And don't fear that. Let it melt away. And as you melt away, sort of just into being space, spacious, let the world around the you that is other than you, usually, also. 
also milk from some recognizable form. The world picture you subliminally maintain around you. You're on the surface of the earth, you're in a building, you're in New York State, you're on the planet of the continent of America, you're on the planet Earth, you're in the solar system, in the galaxy nebula, nebula cluster. Let that all melt away also. disappear into the clear light of the void, the clear light of emptiness, the diamond transparency that is the everything. Beyond the moonlight, beyond the sunlight, <coughs> beyond the darkness, a self-illuminating situation of everything being transparent, where there are no shadows, no light and dark as opposites, because everything is self-luminous. And somehow you are all of it. blissfully being in the ocean of it. Nothing to fear, nothing to worry, nothing to do. Nothing not to do. So then you can arise just for fun, just because you think of others you know of, or don't feel that way, like being vast oceans, although you know they are. Arise in your ideal meditative form, both body and mind. Completely alert, completely present, feeling effortless and balanced. And then look up into the sky of your mind. And in the sky of your mind, to your delight, you see the actual green tower, the Great Mother in the form of a dark green, forest green. Kara, sitting in a very relaxed way, a little bit akimbo, with one leg forward, the other one relaxed, crossed, exquisitely beautiful, radiant and shining, powerful green light rays that split into rainbows at their tips and shower towards you. And around her are all 20 other, myriad other forms of the Great Mother. Behind her somewhere, looking happy to see her as the Medicine Buddha, the dark blue Medicine Buddha. But all around her, there is Isis, there's Vajrayogini, there's Sri Devi, <coughs> there's Uma, Parvati, Durga, Kali, the Holy Ghost is actually Mrs. Yahweh, Ms. Yahweh, Yahweh. <laughs> the Holy Ms. Yahweh. Isis, the Virgin Mary, no end of them. All of them are 
chatting with each other, smiling, happy to float in the sky above you. And they are so happy to see you concentrating and feeling their blessings and appreciating their blessings. And from their smiles and their glistening teeth, light rays radiate, flow into you, fill you with brilliant light energy, but not agitating energy, balanced, calm energy, blissful energy, energy that connects you totally to them. And then around you is a vast host of beings, and since you're not, you're present, you're imagining that you're present in all time as well as space. All animals are also there, every single kind of animal, including insects, micro-animals, bacteria, the microbiome creatures, and all kinds of inconceivable sci-fi creatures, as well as the humans that you know. But all of them at different times in their infinite life have been human and will be human. So you, for a good omen, think of them all as human. And in the front rows of this vast host that sits around you, circling around you, your retinue, your entourage. In the front rows are beings that you know or are acquainted with. In the front rows along your left side, <coughs> ranging forward, are all of those whom you love. Thinking of them being there makes you happy. You see them smiling happily at you. You feel so pleased to be, to know them, to love them, feel their love for you. Straight in front of you are all those who you are just acquainted with and you don't have any particular straight feelings for or against. They're sort of unknowns to you, but you sort of recognize them. And reigns all the front rows of the right side, of your right side, of those who you'd rather not think about, who you really dislike, who have harmed you, or you fear will harm you, and you loathe and fear them. And they can be from any time in history, some mass murderers, some horrible creatures, they can even be devils or demons. Really the worst kind of being. You just even feel offended that you have to think about them. But you notice all of these beings are looking at you because they do not see the vast host, the multitude of the great mother manifestations, the great goddesses in the sky, along with the medicine Buddha and other Buddhas, supporting them, partnering with them, securing them behind. But these beings, the friends, the loved ones, the neutral ones, the hated ones, feared ones, all of them are looking at you and they see you shining and brilliant and rainbow colored and radiant. Just like you see the, the Tara, green Tara, white Tara, yellow Tara, golden Tara, red Tara, blue Tara. They see you like that, like a flood of rainbow light, showering them with light. And the light like, just reflects from you equally to the enemy, the neutral and the, and the loved one, equally. Because you're just reflecting. And they appreciate it, all of them actually. The loved one, of course, loves seeing you happy and feel your blessing. The neutral one is intrigued to receive this energy without really knowing you, but seeing you shining. And the enemy is happy to get your energy for themselves. And they still appreciate it and think you're silly to shine on them because they don't like you. But you shine on them nonetheless. And it actually makes them feel better. And then they feel less interested in being your enemy. So just you bathe in being this nexus that all the great mothers 
radiating and filling you with light and energy and calm and clarity. And then you transmitting this simultaneously, resonating it out towards all beings and receiving gratitude and appreciation for your graciousness to them. Because they, it's just coming through you, but they perceive it as from you. And then you send your gratitude and appreciation to the graciousness of all the great Mother God. And this is the set in this setting with this backing of this energy, and for these altruistic purposes of illuminating all beings around you, there is nothing that you cannot understand. There's nothing that you cannot realize. There's nothing that you cannot manifest. Your creativity is totally good, totally cosmic. It is one with the creativity of all the most admired beings. You can add in the range of the beings in the sky, your sky of refuge and blessing and sanctuary. You can add in there all human beings that you know who have blessed you, teachers that you have had, parents, loved ones, friends, beings who love you and have supported you. You can add them all up there. Those who you especially who you admire, that you do not have to know them personally. <clears throat> you see them smiling towards you. And they are all there for you. So you feel completely any previous image you may have had of yourself of being unable to understand, unable to be creative, somehow not worthy, somehow not enough of this or that, is all melted away. And you are just the channel of the infinite creativity of the love of the universe, of the clear light of the void, of the love of all enlightened, selfless, loving beings. Just bathe in it. And although you are, and then don't worry if you can't keep this vision held in your mind. Just by running through it, you sort of have a glimpse unless you have a very stable mind from long concentration practice. You have a glimpse of, say, something like a green tarot or a mother goddess or a Virgin Mary or, Krishna, or, or Radha, Sita, Uma, Parvati, whoever it may be. But once you glimpse there, you just know they're there. You feel the light come from them. And then you imagine all the beings around you in a vast host. And once you scan over that in your imagination, you just know they're there. You don't have to keep thinking about it. You don't have to get frustrated. Oh, I can't visualize that. Oh, ah. You know, just ignore, bring your mind back to bathing in the infinite blessing and graciousness of the love of the infinite love that is the most powerful force of the universe. Vajra force. And then you can forget about that setting. But that becomes, as you get used to that, that becomes your shrine setting, your special mandala, sacred circle that you create around yourself when you want to try to go deeper, to expand your awareness, to evolve consciously mind, speech, and body to carry your learning and your insight into deeper realization. So now forget about the scene and turn your mind toward your own preciousness, your precious human embodiment endowed with liberty and opportunity. And just even whatever your personal belief may be for the moment experimentally, just imagine that you have lived from beginning this time in every different conceivable form. Since infinite means beginningless means infinite, infinite means you cannot exclude that you have not been anything. You have been evil, actually, as well as good. You've been divine as well as demonic. You've been human many times and animal many times. And now, that vast background and your skillful moving in that background 
to be more expansive and more connected to more beings through your through your embracing body and your embracing imagination, sense of identification. You are this amazing human being. And if you have a greater advantage of that form, you are a female human being. More sensitive, more alert by nature to your connectedness. And what a pre precious embodiment that is. At the same time, think of how you've been instructed maybe both consciously and unconsciously that you're not very worthy. That there's not a lot you can do. That you just should sort of be resigned to whatever lowly result or role. And that it's not really possible to get that, do that much, get that much, be that much. And then ask yourself, who told me that? Why did they keep telling you, you can't do this and you can't do that? And what is their evidence that I can? And how do they know what I am? The Great Mother knows that I can do everything. That I have done everything. And now I'm in a position to do it even better and better. By being one with her. The Great Transcendent Wisdom Mother, who is not only my feeling of connection and groundedness, but it is that feeling as a realistic intelligence, as my intelligence, my intelligence that is critical about the absoluteness of any sense of limitedness and boundary that I may have. Because I do look forward to an infinite future with all the beings, interwoven and interentangled with all life. No limit. And then realize, quickly moving, just like a little bit of an arpeggio, but gee whiz, this particular embodiment that I have, I will definitely lose. There's this thing called death, which, show, which is the impermanence of this constructed thing, which is my body, made of causes and conditions, within conditions. And I will leave my soul continuum, my subtle spiritual essence will go on in, as a, not as a fixed thing but as a, as a trans, constantly transmuting and transforming continuum and it may go from the cocoon of this body into a magnificent butterfly if I guide it artistically in that direction it could fall back into some less free form which I don't want but the main thing is I must learn how to Navigate this, because I will be losing this body, the vehicle of the marvelous sens sensitivity that I have, marvelous intelligence that I have, the memories that I have. A lot of them will, will be lost. So what is it that I will keep through that doorway? And that I should invest in to make sure it is love, freedom, generosity, patience, intelligence, concentration. Creativity. And then looking ahead, I, I, I recognize <coughs> many forms of problems. I realize even if I live in the Trump Tower or in the cosmic Trump Tower of heaven, there will be problems in heaven. Some annoying people will also go to heaven, hurt me, irritate me. Some other angel will brush me with their wing in an annoying way. And everything will, there will be some imperfection and dissatisfaction with everything. So I don't really necessarily only want to go to heaven. Actually, I'd rather stay human, rather stay in this place in the center of the cosmos, in the center of the scale, where I have the intelligence and I have the vulnerability and I have the ambition to become infinite. I'm not satisfied with some sort of temporary comfort, impermanent comfort. And then I remember about how to be skillful about evolution. And I realize that every act of generosity, true generosity, every act of 
altruistic, ethicality, doing something that because of how it positively affects another, every act of patience and tolerance, not reacting negatively when another is harmful to me, every act of creativity, of not just settling for whatever it is, but always seeing infinite baby steps toward improvement, every act of concentration, every act of intelligent discernment, prayer, receptivity, insight, and majesty, magnificent, beauty. All of these things I must, that I do, creates the seed of that shapes my soul, my super subtle spiritual gene, my soul gene, that goes on, that is deathless, that continues forever. So that's where I want to put my focus. And simultaneously I recognize that all these beings around me, enemies too, temporary now enemies, temporary now loved ones, although I want them all to be loved ones, and that's the best. And I want them all to love me, of course. Enemy, I don't even like because they seem not to love me. But I want them all to love me, and I want them all to love all of them. And neutrals, of course. Why bother with neutrals when they can love me, and I can love them? And then looking at all of that, in my mind's eye, now that I know my own vastness in the past and future as well as present, I realize they have the same vastness. They all come from beginningless universe, many universes, without beginning, infinite. They all go into infinite future. We are all completely intertwined with each other. And they have all been my mothers in previous lives. They have been manifestations of the Great Mother to me many, many previous lives. I have also to them, but that's not to be emphasized. I want to emphasize that they have all been my mothers. And I must feel the same appreciation and love for them, for their gracious mothering of me. And I must return the favors to them. I must love them unrestricted and equanimous compassion and love. Even if my mother of this life was a pain when I grew up, still she carried me in her womb. She suffered to bring me forth. She looked after me directly or indirectly in some way. I must honor the Great Mother by not restricting my ability to understand her fully, meaning to be her, to embrace her essence, to let, to meld my heart, have a Vulcan, not just mind meld, but heart meld with the Great Mother, which I can only do through opening my intelligence my intuition, my wisdom, to know all my mother beings and all the mother goddess beings as one being with me, all manifestations of the clear light of the Lord, of pure love, infinite energy that is available to remove suffering and give happiness, grant happiness, universally in every direction. Now second, within that, still in this framework, having rehearsed a kind of arpeggio of unity, 
of celebrating confidently our own full enlightenment through the great mother of all Buddha, who has mothered us in life infinite times and who wants to mother us to Buddhahood, which is infinite life, and awareness of infinite life, and free us from ignorance. We now want to practice reminding ourselves of her embrace at all times, her interfusion, her presence in every atom, cell, and molecule within our body and mind, the super subtle and every level. We now will repeat together meditatively, very murmuring, not chanting, but murmuring in a meditational way, the mantra that we learned. I'll be a little bit louder so that you can remember it in case you haven't memorized it. Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Ve Swaha 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 Om Dare Tutare Tu Reswa 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 Om D
socialized to express their anger more readily and be more domineering and if you have brothers, maybe a father, colleagues at school, males will interrupt their conversation. Males will like be like that. And women are socialized to be more patient and receptive, which actually is a virtue. And I think it's so brilliant what Isa said about that aggressiveness with some the males is a weakness. So unfortunately, too many people tell women, are oh, you supposed to get angry? And that's the way you find your equality is to anger. And so I want to just talk about that in it for a moment, because it's so important. And, there, and the key essence of it, I'm going, to use, I'm going to read you just a few verses from Shantideva and comment on it, and recommend that book, of course, to everyone. I saw John Deep had a copy. She was running around with a copy earlier. And it's called Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. Another translation is called The Way of the Bodhisattva. There's like four or five translations because it is a great, great, great classic. Not only about anger and patience, but about all, all of the evolutionary practice of improving one's infinite life, seeing to it that one's infinite life goes in a positive direction. But his sixth chapter, which is the chapter on patience or tolerance, which is the antidote to anger, or hatred, anger slash hatred, is really an absolute classic. And of course, it's a great, it's part of the, what's called the special precept of love and compassion, of the equal exchange of self and other, that is the special gift of His Holiness, the 14th Lama, to the planet. His whole thing about his religion is kindness, the common human religion is kindness, and all of that sort of stuff comes from this. In a way, it comes from Manjushri and Shantideva, and Nagarjuna and Shantideva. These verses are wonderful. Oh yeah, the key insight is, women should be more forceful, yes, from strength, from the knowledge internally of their deepest, deathless, reality-based strength, which is unshakable. Akshubya, as I say, cannot be can never be lost. It will never, even they die, it will not disappear. They will always rest in it. They will bring forth new life for themselves and others, always. It's, it's that kind of strength. And, and then, then from that, there should be the confidence to project more force. But that force should always be projected with the emotional energy of joy, the emotional energy of humor, emotional energy of happiness, never the emotional energy of anger and hatred, based on which is always based on weakness. And there's an, an addiction, it's called a mental addiction, because it's deception 
to us ignorant beings is that it's making us strong when we feel weak. That's why it's addictive. When you have get in a rage, a tower of rage, you feel like it's strong. And that's why it seduces you into, therefore, becoming its tool. But since it is actually deceiving you in your distorted, wrong sense of weakness, it leads you into a worse situation. And it harms yourself and others. That's the key of the essence to it. But that's very subtle, the idea of separating force from anger. And, and taking the force, your force, back from the addictive habit of anger. That's the key. Totally key. And he begins, he says, whatever my virtuous deeds, devotion to Buddha's generosity and so on, amassed over a thousand aeons, all are destroyed in a moment of fury. <laughs> and talk about relationships. How many relationships have we had that were sort of okay, they were budding, they were ups and downs, it could have been really positive for a while, and then somehow something happened and one really lost it. And was said all kinds of horrible things, did horrible things, maybe it was violent, and lost the relationship completely. How many times has that happened to people? I think maybe you guys are nicer than me. <laughs> Too many times. There is no sin as harmful as hate. Anger, hate. No penance as effective as tolerance. Thus, you know, no asceticism, no, no, no ascetical repentance as effective as tolerance. Thus, by all possible means, I should cultivate tolerance with intensity, fierce, fierce tolerance I should develop. In other words, I should develop tolerance to such a degree that no matter what they do to me, it doesn't make me angry, it doesn't make me hate them. It might make me be forceful with them or myself, or preventing them or avoiding them, or stopping them from doing more, whatever it might be, but never out of anger or hatred, which is possible, actually. And the key to that is it's like, if we understand that anger, hatred, or make it a dash thing, because sometimes people want to make anger into a good thing, which it is, it never is, actually. So anger, hatred, and you know that it isn't because when you feel it, you feel painful. It makes you feel painful, therefore it's not good. You know, the angry person feels very stressed. You know, the cortisol is flowing. Very bad for the health and so forth. So, with any addiction, the first step, cigarettes, you know, whatever it might be, is it's really no good and I don't want to do it anymore. And that's, that's a very important step because addictive things, addictive <coughs> habits, are seductive. They are addictive because they seem to, they deceive us into thinking they are helping us. Keeping the mind wounded by hate, by anger, hate. I will never experience peace. I will have no joy or happiness. I will lose sleep and writhe with discontent. But that's how it feels to be angry, right? Doesn't it? Even a Lord whose magnanimity is vital to those he gives wealth and status to, is nonetheless in danger of being killed if he has hatred for them. You know, if he does it with contempt and despising them, even though he's the source of livelihood, they'll rebel and they'll, they'll, they'll hate him back. So it's also it's bad for you, in the previous words, bad for your relationship. Hate, anger, hate, wears out friends and relatives. Though attracted by your generosity, they will not trust you. In sum, there is no way to live happily together with the fire of rage. Anger, my only real enemy, hatred and anger, creates such sufferings as these. But who controls and conquers it finds happiness here and hereafter. So that first part is just developing the resolve to, to fashion for yourself the invulnerable shield of tolerance where nothing can hurt you because even something that seems on the surface to hurt you can use to your advantage by strengthening your tolerance. It's a very, very deep thing. It's the only way to be safe, actually. 
hate. Now this verse is really now key, moves into another thing of giving insight. Hate, anger, hate, finds its fuel in the mental discomfort I feel faced with the unwanted happening and the blocking of what I want to happen. It then explodes and overwhelms me. So this is the key. When something is happening we do not like and we sort of grin and bear it but we're very frustrated and the frustration builds and builds and builds. Or it could be some good thing that we want to see happening is being blocked by some bad people we think who are bad and we're frustrated and builds and builds and builds and then it explodes because we feel weak, unable to affect the situation. We can't make the good thing happen, we can't prevent the bad thing from happening. We feel weak. Anger comes to us in our own voice and says, you know, you can't do anything about this, but if you blow up, you'll have the strength to do something about it. And then we blow. You follow? That's the mechanism. This will make you strong uh, when you feel weak, precisely. That's very important to, to be aware of. Seeing that, I should carefully eliminate that food that gives life to the enemy. For that enemy has no activity at all other than causing me harm. And here the enemy is my own anger, hatred. It's not the person who's blocking the good thing I want to see happen, who's causing the bad thing I want to see. That's not the real enemy. It's temporarily an enemy. But the real enemy <coughs> is my anger, hatred, that is going to make me... The enemy is probably doing it. The, the relative enemy outside of me is probably doing it because they feel I'm on their way of their time. I'm blocking what they want to see happen. And they're just acting helplessly the tool of their anger and hatred. So if I become angry and hatred, it has conquered me, and now I'm just also the tool of angry and hatred, and we have this spiral of violence, a cycle, a vicious circle, vicious cycle. And this is key. Whatever happens, and this is the sacred feminine that you can be and do. Whatever happens, I must not allow my cheerfulness to be disturbed. Being unhappy won't fulfill my wish and will lose me all my virtues. And here's, here's the sort of kicker verse, which I don't like how I translate it, but why be unhappy about something if it can't be fixed? Why be unhappy about something if it can't be fixed? <laughs> Basically, why be unhappy? And here is the key. When you feel frustrated because the world is not conforming to your wish, positive or negative, whichever it is, and then frustration, you then immediately right, you use your mindfulness to you recognize, ah, this frustration will build up and I'm going to blow up if I let it go on. So then what you do is you intervene. And here's where the divine feminine's green tower force can come out. Just when you begin to feel frustrated, but you're still cheerful. So then you intervene, you tell that jerky guy who's talking trash. You know. I'll give an example. Zinna's <coughs> here, she doesn't like when I use her example. But she's not here, so I can say, for example, sometimes I'll come in our long life together, I will come back <coughs> to a situation where I'm angry because somebody was really stupid and all this and that happened. I'm very frustrated, angry. I say, you know what happened? And, I, and I'm allowed to tell her. And she says, well, must have been awful. But why don't you shut up about it before we're both pissed off? <laughs> <laughs> and she says it in a cheerful way. And then, because it's cheerful, at first I want to get more, well, you're not listening to me and sharing it. And then I realize, well, of course, we don't want to both be freaked out. <laughs> and later I can calmly say if it's something important. <laughs> and I'm no longer free. And it completely sh shoots it away. It makes me want to, because it makes me want to restrain myself. Because you can't restrain another person who is like being mentally humble. You know, I, like people who are liberals and who really want the best for the world, for example, the revolutionaries. This is what you said about resistance movements. I think we were talking somewhere. You're right. You know, you can be somewhere and things are happy, and then suddenly the, 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 the professional, protester 
you know, like a little bit Ralph Nader, for example. Or oh, they're all not great. And it goes right there, really, how horrible they are, Chomsky or something like that. And then suddenly all the evildoers are right there in the room with you. <laughs> and everyone's mad. And then, of course, nobody can think of what to do. Anything positive, you see. So this is, joy is the key. Happiness is the key. Cheerfulness. I think the secret of the British Empire is the cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Of course, they stole it from China. They were the Colombian drug dealers of the Asian world. They grew up here in India and smuggled it into China because the Chinese didn't want their weird goods and certainly didn't want their cooking. <laughs> they didn't want anything much. And then they wanted the tea. You know. But then anyway, they did that. And then they got their tea. And then when everybody was all, bombs were falling, they, let's have a cup of tea. <laughs> right? Although actually, the people who invented the cup of tea were Buddhist monks, actually, in uh, China, in the eastern part, of, western part of China, upon the borderlands of Tibet, where the best tea grew. And they, they used the tea to stay awake meditating, so they wouldn't pass out and fall asleep. Which is why you do sit up meditating better. You can meditate right now, but there's a tendency to pass out. So this I just want to share. Because the, the woman in our culture doesn't play hockey or lacrosse and football, usually, in the old days. It's not socialized to be quick to being forced. And the key to adjusting that balance is not to resist angrily, because then they will bring down more counteraction and violence upon themselves, and also they'll feel bad doing it and make it worse. But to use forcefulness and to break in, you know, you know, every, and use their intuition. You know, Alexander brought up intuition very helpfully. You know, when some, when you go on a date, when you meet somebody, you know in three minutes if they're an absolute moron, idiot, <laughs> feel more, you know, well, that would be a Republican, I didn't know that right away. But <laughs> nowadays, nowadays, the old days they were okay, but now they're all messed up. And, you know, but you know right away. And then, but what you do, uh, socialize to do is, Bear with it. Okay, sure. Keep talking trash. Keep talking stupid things. Repeat Rush Limbaugh's latest sermon to you. Go ahead. Then, and then you get more and more irritated. And finally, they say something that crosses the line. You blow up. Doesn't it, have, has it ever happened to any of you? I think so. <laughs> so the key there is snap. Do that intuition. Well, I knew that person was going to turn out to be an idiot. Well, then go right away in there with humor. Hey, man, that's so stupid. Uh, do, you, do you enjoy being stupid? Or is it just uh, for fun? Or what, what can we do about it? Can we learn something? How about a fact? You know? Whatever. And then they'll either leave, which is good. Actually, my eldest son, who is much smarter than me, he has a motto from Nina. <laughs> motto about me. He's also very good. I'll just tell you. So he's always a little critical as a parent. And he says, that's all I want to read. And he says, my motto is, because he gets it from my carpentry, because I built my own house. <laughs> and I have a carpenter. He says, my dad's motto is, why do it right when you can do it yourself? And his motto about me is, why be nice to them for a while, only to have them get mad at you later, when you can piss them off right away? <laughs> But it's actually she gets oh, I don't know. It's very she's a little proud of it too. But it's very important for women in our society. And actually if you're really joyful and you you're so skillful and you have great good humor and beauty. And so you can you can get in there to the Donald Trump type before they rant if they just start to rant and rant. And you can kind of tweak it in another direction by intervening and resisting, but in a humorous way. What trick? But standing up for yourself mm -hmm. and, and saying, I'm not going to tolerate this thing that's going to lead to me being frustrated and then being angry. And either expressing the anger in an angry way and getting more angry from this abuse, this stupidity, or not expressing it ever and then internalizing it and feeling all depressed. Either way. It isn't the anger, you know, it, it, if you express anger, it doesn't make you feel better. 
But if you are forceful, happily, you feel better. The key is, you never need to start not feeling better. That's the most important point. <laughs> in Shanti Deva's teaching. And it takes mindfulness. It, the, the purpose of mindfulness, you know that thing about everybody does vipassana, and they, but, but they don't really usually get to the real level of vipassana, which is where you're looking for the self and failing to find it. That's what vipassana really is aiming at. But the first level of it, which is the mindfulness level, is where you count that breath, and then your mind wanders off into memory or fantasy or expectation or worry. Trains of thought takes it away from counting your breath. Then you suddenly go, oh, oh, back to breath. And then you feel bad, your mind wanders, and all this kind of thing. But what the point of that is, is to dismount from the thought stream. To begin to realize that you have a choice internally. Where's that lovely lady who talked about choice? Oh, she left this morning. She's, she's, yeah, she's gone. What? You know? Nancy. what? Nancy. Nancy, that's right. Oh, too bad. Anyway, you have an inner choice, but you have a thought stream about whatever. You have a choice to follow it or not follow it. You can replace it with a different thought stream. In other words, you develop kind of control. It's like, I like to say, it's like if you've never practiced any kind of mindfulness, which you might have come upon, of course, by nature, not just from Buddhism or something, it's not only by Buddhism. It's, it's in all proverbs of all different cultures to be mindful about your reactivity and your thought and being victim of your own thoughts. But it's very especially sophisticatedly worked out in the, in the Buddhist psychological tradition. And what that means is that you become aware of the mechanisms of reaction. And you don't think because an inner voice of your own tells you something like, I hate that. I have to say something awful to that person, or I can't stand this, or you know, this kind of thing. You can intervene in your mind and say, well, is, I, is it I really can't stand it? Is it necessary to do this? Is there another way of handling it? In other words, you have the freedom internally to choose between how you're going to, whether you're going to follow a reactive pattern or not. And for that, you need to get yourself a little space, split second. That's like taking 10 deep breaths before having a fight, type of thing. You know, that's without Buddhism. You have that. Everyone knows that. But it's a matter of learning to use it and getting more skillful about it. And then you can do, you can keep your good cheer. Right? This is key. And I think it's key in sort of a practical level. It's the third takeaway of the of the uh, sacred thing. Okay? So now, that's it. That's all I have. And what you do at the end of this kind of refuge meditation, where like, the two aspects are, you remember all the great beings, the goddesses, the Buddhas, the Taras, the Virgin Marys, the whoever, the great mothers, whatever it is. And you realize that they are all with you, because they are vast, enlightened, infinite beings, and they are with all other beings, because they think they are the same. They all they realize they all the same. So all the Buddhas, Jesus, Mother Mary, even God, when he's in a good mood and the Holy Ghost is being a real female for him, <laughs> you know, balancing his excessive that macho thing, then they all with every being all the time. So they, when you visualize it, you're just being aware of the reality of it. And then the second component is you're with all the other beings who are needy like you. Your loved ones with all the other like ones, the animals the insects, the demons even. You're with them all. And you're all totally entwined all. So you create a field where you're in this altruism field and you're in this grace field where the amazing grace of all enlightened beings and the divine beings are with you. And that's how you create that. Now, when you finish that any meditation, you create that before any meditation, whatever it is, and you finish it by visualizing that the gracious ones in the sky Divine Mother, you now meditate, you found we're now finishing the meditating. They are there, and they are so pleased with you that you have been doing whatever level of meditation you're doing, you've been counting your breath or whatever it is, mindfulness, seeing all beings as mother, being compassionate, being wise. They're so pleased that instead of sitting up there and sending light rays, they melt into pure light, they flow down to you, they become one with you. And you feel them becoming one with you. 
and you feel them being present forever in your heart at its deepest, soundest level, fused with you. And then you don't just hog that up, you follow their example. And instead of reflecting their light and radiating out to all the beings around you, loved ones, neutral ones, and even enemies, and you flow out into them, and you fuse and become one with them, and disappear out of your meditative, special, self-confident state. Mother Goddess initiated, infused state. And then you, and then, you sort of hear in your mind's eye, or in your mind's ear, one of your relatives, or maybe your enemy, or maybe your neutral neighbor, <laughs> say, hey, where did Toto go? They were just shining over there, where are they? And then you're back in your ordinary persona, in the ordinary world. That's very important to always make that transition and then be back in your usual self, but hopefully somewhat slightly changed by whatever you meditate. Because your normal self is never fixed. It's always a flow being. But it's anyway, your normal self. Therefore, you don't get stuck in this thing that some people who get into these kind of meditations do. But they say, oh, I'm Green Tower, or I'm the Great Mother. I'm not going to wash the dishes. <laughs> I'm not going to pay my parking fee. Because I'm Buddha or something. We, we get people like that. You have to have resilience and flexibility of identity. And be content to be yourself. You're, you're a bit more habitual self with little baby step changes as well as some meditative mind self. Right? Don't get stuck in either way. That's it for me. But we probably want to do some closing thing. Can I just say a little something? Of course, you can closing thing. And we don't have to stop exactly. Okay. But it would be good to stop soon because we have to go into the pack. Clip. I just want to uh, say a little something about anger. Yes. Is that okay? Please. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Um, and um, I, I think it is complementary to um, Shanti Deva's teachings and your teachings. But I, I would like to maybe say something that might sound a little bit contradictory at first, but it's, I hope it's not meant to in any way be that. Um, I think that one of the mistakes that people can make with anger, I, I mean, I totally agree with Bob is saying, is you have, to, you have to develop tolerance and you have to recognize anger as the inner enemy uh, within yourself uh, in terms of drawing on the power of anger in order to act, right? But there's something about anger that is really important, which is that it tells you that there's something wrong. And if you, if you find yourself angry, it's likely that you may have been, either you may have done it yourself or someone else may have had some kind of violation, may have committed some kind of violation. And one of the things, as Bob was saying, is that women are, are taught to, you know, give it up, give it up, give it up. And if you keep giving, if you, if you feel, if you have this sense of anger and you give it up, you can continue to be violated in a way that's not helpful for you. True, absolutely. So it's important to listen to the anger and then think about what is the constructive action that I can take. And Bob is, is uh, prescribing, and Shanti Deva is prescribing this joyful action in a different direction. And I think that's important, but I think it's also important, of course, because, you know, I, I, I help people heal. I mean, that's, that's what I do, right? I try to, my best. And um, so when a person has that feeling, I'm angry, there, there can be some kind of a wound that has been created there by the violation of the other person. Mm -hmm. And the action to take in that case is to heal that wound. That's the first thing to do. And not to go <clears throat> at the other person, as, as, as Bob is saying. But you do need to listen to the anger. You do need to see where the problem is. And if it's coming out of, for instance, giving it up, giving it up, giving it up, then you need to stop giving it up, right? And, you, you, and then that takes courage because one of the ways that women keep peace is to give it up. And you may have to have a little bit of discomfort to, you know, when you stop giving it up, the other person might be, have a little bit of an issue. And then you have to gain strength within yourself, not from anger, from that joyful place, from that place of deep knowing that Bob was talking about, to be able to stand with courage in the face of their dissatisfaction. And so I think that this is a very useful way to work with anger 
in a, in, as Bob was saying, in a skillful way. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. I totally agree. And actually, the, what you're saying, let me just add to it something, building again, that I 100% agree with it. And as I was trying to say, that the female must, in our culture, must be more forceful. And there's a way of defining the word in modern parlance, anger, as the name of the force, and hate as the negative thing. So that you separate anger and hate and say the anger part is good. But it's a little dangerous to do that because in the, in the older sort of moralist writings, you know, like all the way back to Seneca in the West, Seneca, you know, the, the anger is the one, and if you go into, you know, words for anger in other languages, they all have to do with feeling pain. And so, so the, and the Tibetans, when they translated Sanskrit, dvesha, dvesha, which means, which is one word, but it means like to destroy something. And then, but the Tibetans translated as both anger and hate, to, and they made a joint word, shaitan, anger, hate. So if you need to take anger as the name for the force and make it a positive thing, there is a way of working with it, yes. And, and part of the reason for that is that anger very much connects to intelligence. Because intelligence is discriminatory and analyzes what is good from what is bad, takes things apart. So in a way, it destroys things in a way. Intelligence destroys the surface appearance of something by taking apart looking at its causes and parts and pieces, etc. So, and physically, in, Tibet, in Buddhist medicine, which then leaked over into Ayurveda, actually, as well, although they think they got it from somewhere else, <laughs> but it's connected to bile, which is the heat and the acidic part, of, you know, digestive bile, seeing bile, uh, there's five biles you know, that function in different parts of the body, and uh, they are the heated part of the, of the metabolism, you need heat. So, so there's a, it, and it would be bad to have no bile. You know, but on the other hand, you know, we say billion, it's a billion personality, it's a very irritable personality, right? We see with you. So Buddhist medicine has it like that. So what you are saying is certainly true. To, the worst thing is to let that frustration happen, right? Being abused and violated. Let it build up even to anger, but be so socialized and so frightened to completely internalize it. And that will lead to sickness, mm -hmm. for sure. And so there, it's kind of useful in our in our overly suppressed culture to to you know let it, let the heat rise. And I, I mean, I developed a strong anger habit personally because I had an older brother who tremendously bullied me so much that I didn't even know it until many years later, when 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 my mother told me uh, to re when I had asked her like, what's his problem? You know, when he was behaving weirdly even that. You know, at 30 years old or something. She said, oh, no, oh, your brother almost loved you. Why, he used to come in when you were a baby, and he used to say, that Bobby, he's so great. Every time I knock him down, he jumps right back up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. I didn't repress him, but then I developed the idea of X because feeling weak, because I was smaller. I developed a very escalating temper. Which would make him like caution, you know, would make him like back off. But that's a really bad habit. So. And uh, so, so, anyway, I 100% agree. Anger has its own intelligence. It is the heat. It's heat. If you can set, oh yeah, I want to tell a story. In, in struggling with that temple, finally after reading Shanti Diva for years and dealing with me, I was in a situation nearby the Dalai Lama, in a spiritual practice situation, and there was a person. And I won't get to try to avoid giving details, but who always used to really be a block and a pain in the neck and cause a lot of suffering. And this person was at his absolute worst way of behaving and causing tremendous distortion and difficulty. And, so, and I just felt this heat come up through my chest and solar plexus, and my arms just wanted to choke the guy. <laughs> and you know, they, the, the arms actually just, you know, like a multi-armed day, and the arms just want to go. But somehow, I just let the heat go, and there was a, a way of disidentifying from it, and the arms were just relaxed. And this heat flowed out at the top. <laughs> just heat. And then I, but I was able to smile. <laughs> and it was just, 
he was right. Just because there was this big heat, and I think I probably flushed, looked flushed. But I had no movement at all, and it was, it was completely <coughs> separate from me. And I was free of it completely. And then I was able to make choices of certain things I said and did, and I actually solved the problem without saying anything harmful or hurtful or anything to create more resistance and more problems. It was a really marvelous moment, gift of Shanti Deva, 100%. And of Dharma, my own teaching finally registered in a certain way where you really free of that reaction. Very, very key. Not that I had that happens every time since either, <laughs> but it was a breakthrough moment. So that's where you, 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 force is important. You have to be more forceful, always. Always. And you, you talk, he says, talk about the, the power of the Great Mother and so forth. It's really good. And, and it's the force of joy and beauty and everything. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Can I make a small request of the teachers and everybody here? Maybe we can do a group photo? Yes. Oh, that's great. What's that? Could we do a group photo? Everyone kind of get around you guys and do a group photo? Oh, okay. sure. Can we close circle and then yeah, do that? circle. Okay. And then after we close circle, if you could um, fold your blankets neatly and put